uh, can someone, can you hear me? Please, if you can hear me, let me know you can hear the sound. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The audio is good. Thank you. Yes, it is. Thank you. All right, praise the Lord. It's good to have everyone back in class. May the Lord bless and keep you. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we magnify your name this evening. We lift your name on high. You are worthy, you are faithful, you are good. You are the Lord and you never change. We thank you for the grace to be in your presence. We thank you for what you have in store for us tonight. Lord, we pray for the gift of understanding. Let it be endowed us right now. Let it be given unto us, Holy Spirit. We want you to be our teacher, our instructor. Holy Spirit, take absolute control. Give us the spirit of understanding from heaven above, so that we may know even more than our instructor, all to the glory of your name. Let this prepare us for the great assignment that you have for us. Above it all, let it prepare us, O God, for heaven. Thank you, Heavenly Father. At the end of this class tonight, we will look back and give glory and honor to your name, and our life will no longer be the same. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Again, it's good to have everyone back in class. Uh, before we continue, I receive a couple of emails of people uh, complaining that they, don't, they find it difficult to comprehend this class. They find it difficult to, uh, to even study, to understand. Somebody was even asking me, what exactly is the purpose of uh, taking this class? So I want to ask us, are we all facing this, uh, the same difficulties? Do we have difficulties understanding this class? <laughs> please, let me, <laughs> please let me know what you think. Just, uh-oh, somebody say yes, amen, yes. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Please, you, you can unmute your, <laughs> let me hear you. <laughs> Let me hear what you think. <laughs> you cannot mute your audio. Let me let me hear you. Let me hear you. Yes. So we all have difficult understanding what we are doing. Oh wow. Okay. Uh, so far to this point where we are in uh, synoptic gospel. So I understand it to this point, let me know. If you understand it to this point, so. But to the, to the point where we are right now, if you are still struggling, please let me know. I want us to know before we continue tonight. I think this, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can. <laughs> I think the struggle is, um, it seemed to me like even the, um, the authors or those who are involved have problem <laughs> have problem figuring out um, 
who's who who did what and so here we are trying to read something that they they can't even understand themselves <laughs> <laughs> we tried to figure it out too. <laughs> <laughs> well, then welcome. And, and just, to, uh -huh. and just to add, and just to add the back and forth, I, I think I've, I realized so when I was doing the assignment, uh, the back and forth, and you know they try to explain a situation, then they take it from this verse. And then they take you to another book, then they bring you back. And uh, for me, I found that difficult to comprehend. And I'm like, okay, what is it then that I need to go with? So that's why I got confused at one point as I was doing the assignment, but I needed to do the assignment to get it done. <laughs> so perhaps, but I think that uh, perhaps clarification in this class would help um, yes, besides just reading the book itself. And who is oh, speaking, please, because I can't see your face. Oh, I tried to put up my hand. It's Grace. Grace okay. Yeah. God, God bless you. You see, that's what sets you apart. Being a Bible student and just uh, compared to just being a church member. Because what we are doing, the reason why we find it difficult is because we are stretching us out of our comfort zone. We are stretching us out of what we used to be, the limited knowledge we used to have. And when you're talking about comparing one verse to another to another, what we're trying to do, don't forget what uh, we discussed in the first, first, first class, that what we're trying to do in this class is to investigate, if we remember that. Yeah. In, in the process of investigation, there are so many things you will come across, but you don't reach the conclusion until when we finish the class. That's what we're doing. We're trying to find out the truth. And in, in order to do that, we will look at different theories and different views of all these uh, scholars, what this belief, what that belief, what this belief. So at the end, we will now reach a conclusion that this is the truth. And that's what we are doing. Because when I received these emails, uh, two days ago, I was contemplating, do, if everybody is facing the same problem, do we need to drop this class and take another easy one? But if we take a, an easy class, that makes sure you remain what you used to be. And we don't want that. Am I, am I, am I getting across? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, so we, we don't want that. We want to be better. We want to become uh, Bible scholars. We want to become Bible students. That wherever you stand and you are speaking in the script about the scripture or you are teaching the scripture, everyone will know that your knowledge is beyond what it used to be. Your knowledge is beyond just pick up your Bible and read from Genesis to Revelation. Many of us, we have done that so many times and we are so proud of it. Glory to God is great. But there's more, very much, much more. And that's what we're trying to achieve. That's what we're trying to do to shake us off and take us out of our comfort zone and stretch us so we can be where we're supposed to be. And that's one of the reasons when I gave us the, this particular assignment to read and summarize. One of the reasons why I did that is for, you to, it's for me to know how you are able to comprehend and to figure all this that looks like confusion, how can you come together and summarize it and reach a conclusion? And when it comes to the assignments, I was talking to somebody not too long ago, it's not even about right or wrong or about what you wrote. It's about how you understand what you, what you read. That's what we grade. 
So that's why it's very important to make sure we understand it. And one other thing that I would, I would like to tell us is before you study, before you read, just pray for understanding. And I believe God, the Lord, will give us that spirit of understanding in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you. I love, I love what the sister said right here. Thank you, Sister Grace. He said, dropping the class shouldn't be an option. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's what I'm talking about. So I've received uh, e not just email, I've re received requests from few people that said, yes, I don't think I can continue. Did they already drop the class? Wow. Yeah, yeah. They already dropped the class. I, I have at least like uh, six or seven people that already dropped the class. Yeah, but it's okay. It's okay. There's one thing I know, if 30, 35 people start the class together, probably at 12, 15, we finish, we graduate. It's okay, that's normal. <laughs> <laughs> I have said, the only place so far, the only place in every, all the places where we have uh, Bible college, the only place that we have 100% of those of the students that register and uh, that graduate, we only lost one student. And it's not because uh, he quit, it's because he passed away. That was in India. The number of students that registered for class, that's the number of the students that graduated after two years. So that's the only place. Beside that, every other place, you see many people, we just withdraw in the middle of it. So it's not new uh, to us, that, but that's okay. But I'm not talking to us as a group now, I'm talking to you as an individual. Number one, quitting is not an option is not an option. If you want to be what God wants you to be in life, quitting is not an option. If you find it difficult, then let's go on our nail and cry to the Lord. Lord, I must do this. I don't want to pull out. And I know the Lord will give you the grace. So we good? Yes. Thank you. Yep, we are here. Mm -hmm. Oh, praise God. <laughs> I like, yes, we are here. <laughs> oh, praise God. All right, Synoptic Gospel, and tonight we are dealing with uh, chapters. Excuse me. Yes, was there, a class, there was there a class last week. I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't receive any communication on Thursday. Yes, there is a communication. We send the email out. No, yeah. I received the email about the weekend, but during the week, um, I wasn't certain whether the class was on on Thursday. I was very specific. I was the one that sent the email out, and the image was very specific. That uh, I'd, I'd name all the three classes. There will be no class. Ah, okay. Thank yeah. you. So Thank I was you. very specific. I was very clear that uh, because the only mistake that I made, as instead of Labor Day, I said um, Memorial Day. I yeah. don't know where I got that from. <laughs> <laughs> I know when you are reading it, you'll be laughing. So it's okay. <laughs> God bless you. All right. So tonight we are covering, I believe you've read it, we are covering uh, chapter 6 and 7. Chapter 6 and 7, and that we complete the introduction. So we have further I hypothesis, that is simple and complex hypothesis, then we have the conclusion, the conclusion. All right, simple and complex hypothesis. So what we're trying to do, we look at all these hypotheses, we look at all these views. So we want to see what each of them believes or what they're trying to uh, what they're trying to tell us, and how can we reach a conclusion? How can we derive our own belief from what they presented to us? Okay, they said this, they said this, they said this. Okay, as a Bible student, what do I believe in all these things that have been presented to me? 
So the first one we are looking at right here is two sources hypothesis. I know many of us, we've studied, we've read it, we've studied it over and over and over, especially uh, the assignment that we did. We focus a lot on two, on two uh, sources hypothesis. It says the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke were written based on the Gospel of Mark. That tells us that the Gospel of Mark was the first Gospel that was written. The Matthew and Luke, they were written based on Mark. And it's try, it, it trying to tell us as well that they were both, that means Matthew and Luke, they were both also written based on that lost source that we call Q. I mean, you have the word Q is, the, is, is, out, is taken out of the word, a German word called uh, Kuel, which means a source. So, when we are talking about these two sorts of hypotheses, as he explained this to us, we need to look at the consequences of it as well. When we are talking about the consequences of the two sorts of hypotheses, if you remember, you read it in the assignment in chapters four and five, especially chapter five, towards the end of chapter five. We, we read about the consequences of the two source hypothesis. Let's quickly go into that. I'm reading from page 91 of the textbook. It says, let us now return to the two source hypothesis and ask if it has been discredited by the problems which have led some to prefer other solutions. It's our, it's our own judgment that the two sources hypothesis it, in its simple form cannot be maintained. Its simple form is this. Number one, Matthew and Luke both copy Mark and Q. And it's trying to prove to us that Q was a document. While another theory said Q was a human being, a source. And there's another, there's another uh, theory that's actually not in this book that says Q is a geographical location, like uh, Palestine or uh, Jerusalem. But these two source hypotheses telling us that Q was a document. Number three, it says Q consists of material known to Matthew and Luke. So that's what they were able to copy from it. Number four, it says neither Matthew nor Luke knew the other. So that means they don't know one another. Number five, the minor agreements. The minor agreement between Mark and Luke against Mark are the result of overlaps between Mark and Q. Personally, as a person, I have a little problem with that when, when it comes to the overlap between Mark and Q, but I don't want to bring that into this uh, tonight. When we get there in the nearest future, we'll talk about that. Number seven, see, Mark did not know Q. The overlaps are coincidental. Hmm. So when we look at it, he said, this hypothesis seems to us unsatisfactory for the following reason. These three reasons. Number one, the minor agreements are too many and too substantial to be explained away. They are too many and too substantial to be explained away. Hmm. Number two, there are instances in which Matthew is the middle term, and in which the simplest explanation is that Mark and Luke copied Matthew. And if we look at it, then we see some conflict right here. We see that something is not right. If you first prove to us that Mark and Luke both copy Mark 
and copy Q, for Mark and Luke to copy, I mean, for Matthew and Luke to copy Mark, that means Mark was the first one that was written. So when we now come down here, that you are telling us that there are instances in which Matthew is the middle term and in which the simplest explanation is that Mark and Luke copied Matthew. That's telling us that Matthew was the first one that was written. We will get to the hypothesis that actually trying to prove that, that Matthew was the first gospel that was written. Then Luke copied it. Then Mark copied Matthew and Luke. So when we look at this, on, on, when you look at the uh, the a PowerPoint on the screen that you are looking at right now is talking about two major problems with these two source hypotheses. Number one, that's the minor agreement we are talking about. It says both Mark, Matthew and Luke agree only where Mark does not. Only, remember, we talk about this in the very beginning. Do Matthew and Luke agree only where Mark is not saying anything about that particular verse? Then what we said earlier on tonight, I said minor agreements are too many and too substantial to, explore, to be explained away. You can't just talk about it and push it aside. No, there are too many. All those minor agreements, there are too many. So that cannot be coincidental. Okay, L let's look at the second uh, problem. The two source hypothesis requires a second source that is called Q. The problem is that this, this source that we, are, that we call Q is not mentioned in any fragment of early Christian texts that were found or in the early Christian church tradition. So if you do uh, a thorough research trying to go into the original language and trying to dig and dig in, this source called Q, we cannot find it. So with that, we have problem with that. We have problem with that. So another thing here is the defense of the two source hypothesis by appeal to overlap between Mark and Q is not satisfactory. No, it's not. All right. Let's, let's leave uh, two source alone for a minute. Let's look for the next one. The Greisbach hypothesis. And what is that? And what does this trying to portray or what is it trying to tell us? It gives priority to the gospel of Matthew. It believes that Matthew was the first, the first gospel that was written. It portrays that the gospel of Luke as based on the gospel of Matthew. And it believes that the gospel of Mark is based on the gospel of Matthew and the gospel of Luke. Okay, this is the problem with this. Whenever you see someone copying another, if the original person, the main source, has a three, three page, three page note, Someone that is copying it will have at least five or six pages. Why? Because after copying that person, you, you will put your own idea into it. So you will add other things to it. So if, Ma if Mark copied Matthew and Luke, why is the book of Mark too short and shorter than both of them? If we look at it, Mark is the shortest then Matthew, then Luke is the longest. So common sense, at this point, let's apply common sense. Common sense tells me that the, the original version should be the shortest one. The longer one is the one that is that copied the original version, and the longest is the one that copied both. But uh, Greisbach is trying to explain it to us in the other way around, in the opposite direction. He said this hypothesis was proposed as an alternative to Mark and Mark and priority. What is Mark? when we say Mark, and we're talking about the book of Mark that he has priority over. 
uh, the other two Gospels. So this hypothesis was proposed as an alternative to mark and priority and the two source hypothesis. All right, let's look at the next one. We have the Golders hypothesis. What is this trying to prove to us? So the theory is that the Gospel of Mark was written first, followed by the Gospel of Matthew, okay? The Gospel of Luke was written after the Gospel of Matthew. So this theory has the advantage of simplicity, and there is no need of hypothetical sources to be created by academics, no, because it's very straightforward, it's very simple. It argues that the Gospel of Mark was used as source material by the author of Matthew. And Luke used both of previous gospel as sources for his gospel, as sources for his gospel. Praise God. I believe before we go to that, we, we will come back to this good as uh, hypothesis. But let's look at the next. It's uh, Botman's view. This view proposed that Matthew is a more original form. It argues that Mark had sources which maintain an independent life and which could be drawn on by Matthew and Luke, even while they were copying Mark. Even while they were copying Mark. It also proposed that Matthew and Luke copied a text of Mark which was earlier than our mark. So at this point, when we look at this, is there a mark earlier than the mark that we have right now? This view, this guy, Rudolf Botman's believe that. Believe that. That's where we see what we call um, mark and deutero mark. So if you have read the textbook, you know what I'm talking about. This is where we have protomark and deuteromark. What is protomark? I believe that protomark, the proto means the original, the first, first one that was created. Like when you want to uh, produce something, you say you created uh, a prototype. The first, first one that was written, the proto mark and the deutero mark, that is the secondary one. So, so it believes that Matthew and Luke copy a text from proto mark, at the same time they copy from deutero mark. We have another view that actually bases on view on that. And not only Mark, even all three of them that they have the first version of each gospel. Then we have the, let me call it the revised version of uh, each gospel. Praise God. So there are two different ways of offering complication of the two. Is that these are two different ways of offering complications of the two source hypothesis. These two views are combined by Rudolf Botman. So he combined both views as his own view. Now, let's look at the next guy, Boismart's theory. Boismart offered a different kind of complicated solution. It envisages multiple documents and also multiple editions of uh, each gospel. The final form of each gospel was dependent on the earlier version of at least two gospels. So let's let's go and look at the uh, the chart on that one. If you can turn uh, your textbook to page 105. Let's go to page 105 of our textbook. And you will see that chart right there under Bosmart solution. Let 
when you look at that chart, you see all those letters right there. We have two Qs, Q, one Q uh, on the left and one to the right. Then we have A, B, C. Then under it, we have intermediate Matthew and intermediate uh, Mark. Then we have Proto Luke. Under that, we have Final Matthew, Final Mark, and Final Luke. But let's look at the notes under it so that we explain it a little bit. So the letter Q appears twice in the bracket in order to indicate that Boisman thing, thinks of there being only one Q. That means it believes that that Q, the source, is only one source. The duplication is only for ease of line drawing. So the source A, it defines as a Palestinian proto-gospel. Palestinian proto-gospel. B is a Gentile Christian revision of it. When we are talking about Palestinian proto-gospel, when we hear the word uh, uh, Palestine, many people always think about uh, the Muslims. No, 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 no. When we are talking about Palestinian, we are talking about the land of the Jews. So that means we are talking about the original, that's why they said Palestinian proto-gospel. That means the gospel that was written originally from Jerusalem. That was written from Jerusalem. So, but B is a Gentile Christian revision of it. And the primary source of intermediate mark. So what it's trying to tell us here is when the original map was written in Jerusalem, now when it gets to the Gentile Christian, it was revised. It was revised. So I, another thing that I want us to pay attention to, if we want to have understanding of each of these gospel, we need to think about the author. Is the author a Jew or a Gentile? And we know that the author of Matthew is a Jew. Matthew is a Jew. What about Luke? Luke is a Gentile. Luke is a Gentile. If, if I remember very well, we discussed this in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. But what about, what about Mark? Mark is a Jew. John Mark. John Mark is a Jew when we look at the, uh, the history book. It tells us that John Mark is the little boy. The little boy that gave, um, that allowed Peter to have access to the palace where Jesus was judged and where Jesus was being chastised and punished on the night when he was arrested, Mark was that little boy that allowed Peter to be able to get inside because he has a connection to the palace. And many people believe, when we are talking about John Mark, the very house where Jesus and his disciples always meet, and the same place where they had uh, the Last Supper was John Mark's mother's house. That's John Mark's house. So that proves to us that John Mark is a Jew. And this same John Mark now grow up to become Apostle Peter's secretary. So now we see that John Mark is a Jew. Matthew is a Jew. But Luke is a Gentile. So at this point, then we need to take a pause. Then again, common sense. If Mark is a Jew, then why do the Gentile need to revise the book that's originally written by a Jew? 
why? It does not make any sense, does it? When we are looking at Luke, Luke is a Gentile. Don't forget when we were uh, trying to understand his method of writing and how he gathered his information in the beginning, then we reach a conclusion that he didn't even travel to Jerusalem. So that means he was right there at home when he was written all this in his own land. Praise God. Now let's look at letter C. Letter C is independent and hold, probably of Palestinian provenance. Now, intermediate Mark and Q play the roles assumed by Mark and Q in the two source hypothesis. Don't forget that in the two source hypothesis, we say Mark and Q overlap. Okay, let me, let me take a pause right here uh, before I continue. Because uh, in all the classes, we have not been given this chance. Please, if you have any question right here, just, just type it in. So we address to make sure we don't pass it and you forget to ask your question if you don't understand at this point where, what I'm talking about. That's why I'm trying to explain it from the textbook so you can read it along as we are going through it. If you remember in two source hypothesis, it's a mark and kill overlaps. So this guy, Bosmite, is trying to explain to us how mark and kill overlaps. He said the mark that overlaps with Q is intermediate mark. What is an intermediate mark? It's not too early, it's not the, the original, original that was written, and it's not the final version is the one in between that overlaps with Q. Okay, it looks like that's a question right here. I'm a little confused. You will not be in Jesus' name. <laughs> I see the woman of God laughing. No, please, please you will not be in Jesus' name. Okay, let, let, me, let me explain this again. Let's look at the chart and the book. What I'm trying to explain right now, I'm not saying this is the correct hypothesis or the correct solution. No. We're just trying to explain what this guy believes. Does that make sense now? Yes. Yeah, we're trying to explain what he believes. We're not saying, yes, this is the final and this is the solution. No. But what he believes, even if you, if you look at the note on your screen, he said he offered a different kind of complicated solution. It is complicated because it doesn't make any sense. It envisages multiple documents and also multiple editions of each gospel. That's when it came up with A, B, C. Then the intermediate mark, intermediate mark. That means intermediate Matthew and intermediate mark. Then we have final Matthew, final mark. We have proto Luke and final Luke. So his own understanding is a little bit complicated. So he was trying to find a solution, to find a solution in between how they were connected. Especially like the, what I said earlier on, especially where Mark and Q, the, the like two sources uh, hypothesis believe that Mark and Q overlapped at some point. So he's trying to prove that, that Mark and Q that overlap is not the proto mark or the final mark, it's intermediate mark. That means it's in between, it's not the original mark or the list, latest version, the final uh, version of mark is the one in between that overlaps with Q. All right. So, so this theory allows for all possibilities, even better than complicated version of the source, the two source hypothesis. Amen. 
Any other uh, comment or question here? You say, how did he get to this solution with added information from original source? You say, that's, you say, one thing I believe is like what we are teaching in class right now. If I ask you to write a note, or uh, how would I put it, a summary, to summarize what we learned today, what each portion we write will be different. Because you will write based on your own understanding. You will write based on the information that you receive. But the question here is, what kind of information did you receive? Do you receive everything that we are teaching now? Or you receive half of it because your mind is somewhere else? And the only half that you receive is what you base whatever you write on. So that is what is going on here. So all these scholars, they came up with different kind of solution. They're trying to solve the, uh, the synoptic problem. What is the synoptic problem? Synoptic problem is we're trying to find out, number one, which of this book is the one that's first written? Not only that, who copied whom? We're trying to find that out. And there are some, past, there are some verses in, in the book of Mark that are not in the Matthew, that are not in the Luke. We're trying to find a way to justify it. How is it that this has this in it and this doesn't have it? So these are synoptic problems. And all these scholars are trying to find a solution to these problems. And by doing that, each of them is basing their, their solution on their understanding on what they know. And one thing I want us to know, even if it's wrong, you still have some people that we believe in it. And that's why we studied the synoptic gospel in class. So we will not follow erroneous teaching. We want to study all these views. When we study all these views, then when we place everything in front of us, even without any instructor, common sense will tell us that, no, 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 this is not right. This is the right. Praise God. All right. I hope I didn't open the can warm tonight. That ask us to start asking questions during the class. <laughs> Another one's okay. I say, amen. Thank you. Amen. Praise God. God bless you, man of God. All right. Let's move on so we stay with this guy it argues that the common material the common material among the three synoptic gospel ultimately derives from a proto gospel somewhat like mark right this proto gospel underwent two independent revision a and b Mark was formed by recombining these two revision. Wrong. Matthew built upon A, and Luke built upon B. But Mark was formed by recombining both A and B. Then it says both Matthew and Luke also drew from a common source called Q as well as other sources from their unique material. From their unique material. All right. Now let's try to find a conclusion. The first thing I want us to, because right now we want, especially based on what we have done so far, we want to reach some kind of conclusion to have to have a better understand not only that to give us a peace of mind as we continue to study it in this class so we think that matthew used mark an undefined other source this is the author speaking now when we say matthew used mark that means based on the author we believe that mark was the first one that was written and Matthew used Mark 
and other sources to write his own gospel. Then we believe that Luke used Mark and Matthew as well as other sources. That's why, if, like I said earlier on, when you look at the book of Mark, he has only 16 chapters, if I'm correct. He has only 16 chapters. Let's look at the book of Matthew. He has more. Let's look at the book of Luke. He has more than Mark and more than Matthew. Why? Because Matthew used Mark and undefined other sources. With undefined other sources, that had more information to what he get from the book of Mark. That's why Matthew is longer than the book of Mark. Now, the book of Luke, I mean, Luke used Mark and Matthew as well as other sources to write his own gospel. That's why, again, again uh, some information from Mark some information that are not in Mark, but are in Matthew, he gained that as well. Then he get more information from other sources. That's why the book of Luke is longer than both of the previous Gospels. Now, there are, there are probably complicating factors in the interrelationship among the Gospel. Yes, yes. There's a possibility that we have complicating factors. In what sense? Like we said earlier on, like the question that somebody asked not too long ago, that when you are reading uh, some verses, like the book explaining to us, you're reading some verses and you read Matthew, Mark in, in the middle, and Luke on the other side. Then you realize that there are some blank space in, in, in the book of Matthew, just an example, the blank space in, in between the verses where Mark is saying something, but it's not in Matthew. But when you look at Luke, it may be there. And when you read it down, you realize that there's some blank space in Luke as well, and in Mark, but it's in Matthew. But the most common thing is Mark, I mean, Luke and Matthew, they both agree in so, on so many things where Mark is not present. Where Mark is not present. What do I mean by Mark is not present? Where Mark, when Mark is not saying anything about that incident or that situation or that parable or that miracle, Mark is silent. But Matthew and Luke, they both say something about it. You will see agreement. That's what we are talking about when we are talking about the two source hypotheses and we talk about minor agreements. That uh, Matthew and Luke agree where Mark is absent. Where Mark is absent. So we have this kind of uh, situation when we're talking about the interrelationship among the gospel, that you see something that is missing here, something that is missing here, something that is missing there. And the question that we may ask is, why is that? Don't forget, don't forget what we just explained earlier on, because we're trying to summarize everything we've been doing all along. Don't forget what we said earlier on. When Mark was written, Mark was the first, first gospel that was written. But when Matthew was writing his own, he used the book of Mark. Then he gathered more information from other undefined sources. That means there are some things that are not in Mark that Matthew just discovered and added it to his own gospel. So that's one of the reasons when you find some things in, in Matthew, but they are not in Mark. The same thing with the book of Luke. And when the book of Luke, the Luke was writing his own gospel, he used Mark and Matthew. Now, why is it that Luke and Matthew agrees where uh, Mark is not present? Don't forget that Luke used Mark and Matthew to write his own gospel. So the information that is not in Mark, 
But Matthew gathered and wrote it. Look at access to it now. He used Matthew as well as Mark to write his own. So that means information in Matthew, most of this information, if you remember, we did that very early. I believe it says like almost 85 or 90 percent of the information uh, of Mark were in Matthew and like 50 percent of it in Luke. So now you see some things that are missing in Matthew, missing in Mark, but they are present there in the book of Luke. Why? Because after he copied Mark and Matthew, he still went ahead and gathered more information from other sources as well. That's why his own book was longer, longer. Praise God. Let me give us an example. Let's look at the example of uh, the angelic announcement of the birth of Jesus Christ. You cannot find it in Matthew. It's not in Matthew. It's not in Mark. It's a personal information that he went out to source, to search for. When the angels came to announce the birth of Jesus and they met the shepherd in the field. We remember the story. They met the shepherd in the field and the angels were singing glory to, the, to God in the highest. So we don't have that in all those first two gospels. So, and that's why we have all these little and minor agreements and disagreements between these gospels. And it's not unlikely that there was crisscross copying among them. No, it's not. Let's quickly review all these uh, sources or theories or uh, whatever we can call it. The first one is the two source theory. There are two further compli further complications. Number one, the evidence that Luke knew Matthew. Number two, the verbatim agreement between Mark and Q in the supposed overlap passages. Of all the solutions, this one, which remained the dominant hypothesis, is the least satisfactory. The least satisfactory. All right? Let's look at the Greisbach hypothesis. It argues that Matthew was copied by Luke, and Mark conflated them both in technic is technically possible. But it suffered from inability to explain Mark like we just did. We cannot explain it. Why is Mark, okay, how, how so that, that's the point number three, right? Said, it, it may be that, there, that here we face only a failure of imagination. Why would anyone carefully conflate parts of Matthew and Luke? Why omitting so much of both? Because if Mark copies both of them, Mark's supposed to be longer than any of them. But it's the shortest among all three. So that tells us that if we want to check and say, no, I scratch this off, I scratch this off at this point, I will scratch this hypothesis off. Because when we are talking about common sense, it does not make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. All right. Let's look at Judas' hypothesis. It argues that mark without Q is also technically possible. Accepting, it depends on being able to explain, again, explanation. Being able to explain how Matthew and Luke were composed. If the only sources were, in Matthew's case, Mark, Scripture, and imagination. When you hear the word Scripture right here, what Scripture is it referring to? The Old Testament. Because what, at the time that they were writing the Gospel, the Old Testament, was available for them. In Luke's case, he has Mark, Matthew, Scripture, and imagination. Thus far, Golda has not persuaded us that one can give up sources for the same material. 
So with this rather substantial modification, however, we accept Gouda's theory. Matthew used Mark and Luke used them both. We accept only that, that Matthew used Mark and Luke used them both. Even if it's just based on their method of writing and the length of their documents. So we can reach the conclusion that Matthew copied Mark, but Luke copied them both. Boismart's multiple source theory. This is also technically possible. Technically, find data in the reconstruction of hypothetical documents can be correct, but it certainly cannot be validated. It certainly cannot be validated. So with this, we can scratch this off as well. All right? If you remember when we are taking uh, exam in class, we call it a uh, process of elimination. Now let's look at this important conclusion. And I would like us to read from the book as well. But before we read from the book, it said, the omission of material in the course of transmission should be accepted as a general possibility. Because many people today, they started losing trust in the scripture because of some omission, some of these things that are missing. Don't forget, like we studied in the like we discussed in the very beginning. Don't forget that these people that wrote the gospel, they are human beings like you, inspired by God, yes. But they are human beings like you as well. They are human beings. So in the course of transmission, so there's a possibility that omission of materials is possible. It's possible. And we need to accept that. And we should, uh, we, we should here affirm one of the general principles of form criticism. The church, that means the canonical council, kept what was useful. Remember, even in the book of John, it's written that if everything that Jesus did was written in this book, the whole world cannot contain it. So on, the only thing that are allowed to be in our Bible are things that are useful and necessary for our salvation. That's all. That's all. And if you can have that at the back of our mind, then we will have peace as we continue to study the scripture. And this principle should apply at all stages in the transmission of the gospel materials, not only the gospel materials, for me, the old Bible, the old Bible. So if you can turn your uh, textbooks to uh, page 111, page 111. No, I'm sorry, not under than 11. Uh, page 119. Page 119. Yes. I read from the top of that page. Say, An individual gospel presum presumably contain what the author or authors found useful. Much that now interests us, or that may have interested, that may have interested other first century Christian was discarded. That this is so is seen clearly if one asks how many details of Jesus' personal life were preserved. The gospel material is notoriously short of them, not because the material was entirely transmitted by people who knew none of them but because knowledge about personal habits, 
friendship and the like was not needed by the church. What does that mean? That is not necessary for our salvation. So everything that is needed for our salvation is what we have in the Bible. It's what we have in the Bible. But as Bible students, we need to study this to know how the gospel come together to be what they are today. So that's why we studied synoptic gospel. When it says synoptic, because they look alike, they copy each other. They follow each other's full step. But at the same time, all those that are missing, we should not look at it negatively. We should look at it in a way that as they were compiling the information, one has more information than the other. That's why we have some, uh, some information missing from here, or some is misdom that in this book is not in that book, and that's why this happened. I hope reaching this conclusion, we help us to see not only the Bible, even this class, from a new, a different perspective. So we will be less confused. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, the Lord is good. Yeah. God is good. So this is where uh, we will stop uh, tonight. So, for our next class, we read uh, chapters 8 and chapter 9. Chapters 8 and 9, Introduction and Creativity and Oral Tradition. Introduction and Creativity of Oral Tradition. But before, uh, before next Wednesday, there's a possibility there's a possibility that you receive email from me. Please check your email. There's a possibility you receive email from me. What will that email contain? A test about this class of today. A test about today's class. So, um, I'm still working on almost finish. Uh, reading and studying uh, the assignment that we sent over. Once it's done, it will be recorded, and we will not send your paper back, but we send you uh, the results to let you know how you did. So, God bless you. Is there any question here before we go tonight? Any question? Uh, this is great. Hi. I agree. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the assignment that you've just communicated. How then do we receive feedback uh, beyond um, the result? Is there a way that you'll give each of us feedback in terms of, you know, our Are understanding? Yes, because we, it would help us really to improve. I would, I would want to know for myself specifically, did I understand it? Am I off track? Do I need to read more? You know, I think that would help me. Over. Okay. Ah, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good one because that alone would take the whole, uh, the, the whole session for us to do that, to go over each person one by one. Because if you desire that, everybody wants that as well. So, um, Apostle, is it possible that you can generalize and perhaps give us feedback as a group? Or uh, this generally, this is my finding, this is my observation, and uh, based oh, from yes, your own we will, we will do that. Uh, once, okay. it's, once we've done with it and send you the result, then we will do that. We will do that, but to go over uh, each person one by one, yeah, that I don't think so. I don't think so. Because don't, don't forget that we have uh, two chapters and we have uh, one page 
summary on each. So that means we have two assignments. Then we have um, the Pentateuch as well. So if you want to go over it one by one, yeah, that will put us behind the schedule for the classes. Yes, ma'am. Sister Sherry, please go ahead. Hi. Um, the quiz that you're going to submit to us via email, it will be due back to you by next class, by next Thursday? No, you will send all the information in the email. Okay. Right. When it is due and everything. Yeah. So did, so did I just hear you say that we have two summaries that are due to, along with the test? No, there's a summary that are due. You already sent it in, I believe. Oh, okay. Yes, I believe. For, for chapters uh, four and five, right? Yes. Do we need to do uh, summaries on these other chapters too? No, no. Okay, thank you. Thank when, whenever you need to do summary, so we communicate uh, to you, we'll let you know. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, and when you are doing the summary, um, I want us to have this at the back of our mind because that's one of the things that sister was telling us that we should communicate. Um, so many of us, I can see the nervousness in your writing. So I can, I can say that. Please don't be. Don't be. Just when you are writing, just be comfortable. Number one, let's pray that God will give us the spirit of understanding. And when you are writing the summary, we ask us to write one page summary, somebody sent me six pages. <clears throat> so when I was reading, I was like, oh man, and you didn't have mercy on me? Don't forget that I have to read everything. <laughs> so that's just a joke. So anyway, but when, we are, when I was reading it, there's one thing I want to pass across to us. As you're writing the summary, what we're trying to do, what I'm, trying to, what I'm expecting to receive from you is not for you to cut and paste from what the author wrote. No. I want you to write in your own word what you understand. Even if it's not the awful page, if it's half of a page, I want to read something from you that is your own words, not what author wrote that you cut, you cut here, you cut there, you cut there, and you paste everything together. Mm -mm. We shouldn't do that. The Lord will give us the grace in Jesus' name. And let me give us one other clue, especially like, let's look at, and that's the reason why, if you notice, you see a change even in presentation. Uh, that's why I made this presentation the, the format that I made it today. For us to have an idea, when you are studying it, you can follow the same pattern. What pattern was that? As you are reading, you see each scholar that made a comment or that wrote their own view. The first thing you do Write each scholars down. Make sure you have their name listed. Then you can go back and study what each person say and compare it to the other. By that, you will have a better understanding of what they are all saying. And at the end, you'll be able, to, even before we get to class, you'll be able to reach your own conclusion. Without laying them down in a paper, you can put them side by side and compare. And you have an idea of what uh, the author is saying, even before it reaches the conclusion, you can reach your own conclusion based on uh, the, your method of uh, study. So let's, let's pull that side by side. Just first make the notes. When you take that note, then you go back and study it one by one. So that makes it much, much easier for us to study. Amen? Is that, is that all right? That makes sense? Yes. God bless you. Is there any other question before we go tonight? Any other question? Then if there's none, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we magnify your name this evening. We lift your name on high. You are the Lord and you never change. 
the ancient of days. We thank you for the grace to study at your feet. Lord, all we pray for is the gift of understanding, the gift of knowledge, spiritual gift of knowledge that will help us to understand what you want us to know. Holy Spirit, let the anointing of East rest upon us. Give us the grace to be able to comprehend whatever we study and whatever we read, all to the glory of your name. And we don't want to take this class just for taking its sake. We want to be useful in your kingdom. We pray that you make us, oh God, a honored vessel in your vineyard, so that we may bring all glory and honor to your name and populate the kingdom of heaven and depopulate the kingdom of the devil in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. And be, quickly before we go, I received an uh, email as well concerning um, the video for Pastor Tunde's class, the last class. We sent it over to you because I wasn't around. So that video was stored in his computer. So I just got it so we forward it to us. Uh, if not tonight, by God's grace, by tomorrow. God okay. bless you. So have a wonderful evening. You too. Thank you. God bless you.